Hello, it is my fourth episode of my thesis writing journey. And you're probably wondering, like, Julia, where have you been? It's been a while since you've posted and I thought you were doing it every week. I have decided to change the format slightly because I realise now that writing a PhD week to week, things don't change that often. So instead, I thought I would do episodes now and I would make new content based on when I'm doing new work. I think that just makes a little bit more sense and it saves you from having to sit and watch me do the same thing over and over again. Over the past few weeks, I have been making figures and it's gonna to continue to be this way for the next two or so weeks, I think. Writing a thesis takes a lot longer than I thought and tasks which you think are gonna take you like no time at all, take you a really long time. And I found that out by recording myself and being like, this is like Groundhog Day. It's the same thing every single day. I'm finding lockdown a lot harder than I thought I was going to. And I know I've touched upon this in the other videos, but it has been really quite a challenge to be focused and stay on top of my work in this contained environment. I've been a bit all over the place and I feel like my heart isn't in my work as much as it normally is. So it's been more like having to sit at my desk and force myself to work. And my brain is just not good in that type of situation. So progress has been slow, but thankfully I think I'm getting an extension from my university because of the disruption caused by the pandemic. So I should be getting at least a three months extension, which is great. I'm still aiming to finish the thesis and hand it in in the autumn. But it's nice to know that I have that extra time if I need it. But still gonna plod on now and keep going and just do as much as I can each day. Yes. I found a really good working routine for myself um, with the PhD. And that is to start doing PhD work first thing in the morning, then taking the afternoon off as like a break. I can chill in that time, do exercise in that time, work on science communication things in that time, but that's more of a creative space. And then in the evening, I pick up some of the PhD work again, but things that are a little bit more mindless. So like organizing something or some mindless, like copying and pasting work. So that's been the routine that I've found works really well for me in this situation. And it's gonna be something that I continue to do. So the point of the thesis I'm currently up to is making those figures. It's, I'm still doing it. But I've moved on from like the analysis portion that I was doing in the past few videos. And now I'm more just doing the physical making of these different figures. So I thought I'd give you a step-by-step -step guide as to how I'm making these. At the minute, I currently have 68 figures just for my results. So it's a lot to manage, but I think I found like quite a good strategy to keep on top of exactly where I am with each figure and mark my progress as I go. That for me is a good motivator if I have a system where I can track my progress. So this is how I've been making figures. The first thing I did was I took my figure list. Now, if you don't know what a figure list is, go back to my second or third video. I can't remember which one, but go back to one of my previous videos and look at how I made a figure list. So I took my figure list and I copied it into Excel and I made a tab for each chapter and copied in all the figures into a spreadsheet. You could just start your figure list in Excel. I didn't think of this, but I was thinking, how am I gonna be able to like track the progress? And a spreadsheet was the best thing that I could think of. So what I did was copied in all these different figures and their titles, and then I made a few different columns so I can track their progress as I go. And this includes what data I'm putting in each figure. Have I started the figure? Yes or no. Any notes on the figure so far? So once I've started it, I can then make some notes like need to fill in headings for this graph. Any data missing, write in if I'm missing anything because I might be on the computer at work and then completed the figure, yes or no. So this is a really nice way to log your progress as you go. And it means that if you stop halfway through a figure, you can just make a note of exactly where you're up to, what you want to do next and shut it down without being like, I'm going to forget all this tomorrow. So I found that really useful. The second thing I did then was take all of the data that I have and sort it into a folder for each figure. So I have a folder for each chapter. In that chapter folder, there is a folder for each figure. And then within each of these folders, I've pulled in all of the raw data. This includes image files, Excels, some of my lab notes, anything to do with that figure, I put it into that individual folder. You can do this before you start making any of your figures, or you can do it as you go along. I do it as I'm going along because I find that I'm a lot more focused on the individual figure at hand as I'm doing it. If I do things en masse, I will definitely miss things out. So I've just been pulling in 
all the different bits of data as I go into these folders. It's super important to have all of these raw files together and know exactly what you've put into each figure for when you're writing up your results. The third thing I did was then to make graphs. For most of my figures, I have graphs in them and these are measuring obviously lots of different variables, different things, but the next thing I wanted to do was make sure I had made all my graphs in the correct format for my thesis. So I had some graphs already made prior to doing this, but they weren't in the format that I want to use for the rest of my thesis. And then I had other graphs which are like auto-generated from software, and that's fine for me to show, you know, to my supervisor, like these are the results very crudely. But again, I want to take those graphs and remake them so they fit with everything else in my results chapter. The software I use to make graphs is GraphPad Prism. I haven't used any other software except Excel, which I'm really not a fan of. I really like GraphPad. It's super easy to use. I think it's really good software, but unfortunately you do have to pay for it. I think for students, it's about £100 for the year, or your lab might already have it and you can investigate with them whether they have a license that they can give to you. And you might even be able to see if some of your student stipend or your lab could cover that cost for you. But GraphPad Prism is what I've been using. The fourth thing I do is once I've made my graphs, I run my statistical analysis on these results. Again, I've been using the GraphPad Prism software to run these analysis. It's really good. It has nearly all of these statistical tests that you could think of already formatted into the software. And you have the option to add your own, which I've done for some of my data because I'm trying to measure a specific variable. You can double check the stats if you want to, but I found that as long as you know what statistical tests you should be using, maybe I should do a video on that, like what stats you should use for different experiments and different setups. I have found that the software is really excellent and has, you know, options for everything that I've ever needed to analyze. And there's many different options within each analysis to like remove or add in. So it's super flexible and it actually gives you an automated spreadsheet with all of the results, all the variables, all the statistical analysis on there to save you doing that yourself. And then once I have the results from the stats, I can add these to my graphs. So I can add, you know, little asterisks, saying things are significant, little NSs when things aren't significant, but I put all the statistical information into the graph before I use it in my figure. The next thing that I do is to compile all of my data for each figure into an individual file. For this, I use Adobe Illustrator, but in the past I have used PowerPoint and found this does work as well. Illustrator just has a bit more of an extensive bank of tools, so it's a bit easier to reformat things as you go because that is the nature of making these types of figures. So what I do is take the raw data that is in those folders that I've told you about and then arrange them into one document. And the way I picture the order of these figures is I think about what does the reader need to know first, second, third, fourth. So the very last graph or picture or whatever it is on there makes sense. So this is how I order them. This part of making figures takes ages for me. It's all about lining things up, making sure all the fonts are the right size and you know, it just, it really like eats at my perfectionistic ways because I just get sucked in and I'm there moving boxes around for hours. But it is really satisfying once it's all done and looks like spot on. What I do then is save this file to my figure folder. So it's in there with all of the raw data and then you can come back to it, open it later and know exactly what you've put in it. The next thing you have to do once you think you've got everything compiled into the document that you need is to check everything go through that figure with a fine tooth comb this is things like check the units on your graph are there check they are correct check your images have scale bars on them if they need them check the resolution of your images all of these small things that can quite easily be overlooked or taken for granted are so important for the reader understanding what your data is showing. So once you think that figure is done, double, triple check it for all of these little tiny things that are really, really important. The penultimate thing that I do once the figure is ready is to write the figure legend. You legend. The figure legend is really important for the reader to get more detail on exactly what you are measuring and what you are trying to show with these results. If you have more than one data set in that figure, you should label these A, B, C, D. And then in the figure legend, you can just write an A and talk about what that image or graph is showing, B, C, D, etc. And this is a really neat way to organize and explain all the data in your one figure. In this legend, you should include things like 
what the different error bars mean, what statistical tests you use, what are you counting as being significant, different p-values, what scale bar sizes are, what concentrations of protein you use, all of these things that you know in your head, get them into that figure legend. So the reader is completely aware of exactly what you've done and what this figure is showing. It's like a semantic illustration of your figure. Oh, I like that semantic illustration. The final thing, and for me, the most satisfying thing is to go back to that Excel spreadsheet and update it. I have a colour coding system for my Excel spreadsheet. Yes, I am that type of person. And all my figures start off with no colour. Once I start them, they are highlighted in a colour. And then once they are complete, I change that colour to a different colour and so I can then track where exactly I'm up to, what I've started, what I've completed and there is honestly no better feeling than changing a figure to a complete colour. It's so good, it is so good. So once you've completed a figure, go back to that Excel and tick it off. So there you have it, that is the way that I have been working for the past few weeks and will continue to do so for the next few weeks. I've been working through my figures in chronological order. So starting at figure one and going through like that. And there are some things that I've started and not yet finished. And there are other things which I have completely completed. So I feel like it's a nice way to make progress and a nice way to measure your progress too, because there are obviously days where you're like, I feel like I've done nothing. But then you look back at the end of the week and you can see your nice Excel spreadsheet, all your colors in there and you feel like, okay, even if I'm moving at a bit of a slow pace, I'm still moving forward. I will be back with another video as soon as I move on to the next phase of my work. I think that will be my introduction and I'll do a few videos on writing a literature review. This will include things like how to find good papers, how to format like really dense, intense topics, how to pick out exactly what you need, how to organise your references and also some organisation hacks for how to keep on top of such a mammoth chunk of writing. So I'll see you then. In the meantime, if you wanna follow my thesis journey day to day, you can catch me on my social medias. I post frequently on there in my stories, especially about what I'm doing each day. And if you're liking the channel, please feel free to subscribe. I've also started doing some science in the news videos. So I pick a few stories each week and talk about the scientific papers behind them, just to give you know a bit more detail and a bit of a critical eye on the research published in the news. So if you're a fan of popular science, they'll be up hopefully every Friday or every other Friday, depending on how crazy the thesis is from now on. Thank you for joining me and I shall see you when my figure Excel list is complete. That's gonna be so satisfying. I can't wait.